Okay, well, we'll get started today. If you remember from the last lecture, ending yesterday, we were working through the rate equations for fluorescence. And I'll, I'll go back just a slide or two, and we'll try to make sure we clear everything up. Remember, the system that we're using is a, what would be re, uh, referred to as a simple two-level model. Okay, we have our initial ground state, and we have our excited state, and they're only coupled by laser radiation. So that's the, the problem that we're working in. And really what you do is just write a set of rate equations for uh, whatever state one that you're initially starting in and state two. And I'll describe these in the next slide and actually in the subsequent lecture, really what we're meaning by N1 and N2. We, we want to clarify that a little bit. But let, right now we just have this kind of generic expression of some state one and two. And I think hopefully it's clear for whatever state we have, we have population uh, metric uh, terms and we have depopulation terms. And for N2, which we're assuming, remember we assume initially there's no uh, population in state two, okay? I'll actually make another mention of this in the next lecture about when and when this is uh, accurate. But right now we're making, so we can see that the only way that we s populate state two is through, we have to have something coming from state one so that's the number density, whatever pool we have to pull from, and then the uh, absorption rate. And then, of course, we can lose by spontaneous mission back down from two to one, uh, stimulated mission from two to one, and then we can have uh, quenching and ionization predissociation. Okay. So the assumptions that we are working in to solve the set of equations uh, are here. Okay, we're going to say that we don't have collisional excitation, meaning that we're not going to let collisions, just pure collisions, send things from the ground state up, okay? We're only coupled by the laser, okay? We're going to assume again that the upper state does not have any population prior to laser excitation. And, and then we're going to also assume there's no chemistry during the course of both the excitation and the subsequent rattling around in the upper state and then the admission. So during the quote unquote measurement, we're going to have no chemistry, okay? So no predissociation, no ionization. So with those uh, assumptions, we are left with these set of uh, rate equations, okay? And now this is where we can actually write this N1 with the superscript. This, turn, this is the initial population it's, it's easy to say uh, N1, okay? And this, uh, to clarify this, this is actually the population in whatever specific quantum state that you're accessing. This is not every one of the molecules in the ground state. This is only a particular rotation, vibrational rotational excitation. And we'll get back to that by looking at the Boltzmann fraction in the next lecture. So this is actually whatever state whatever rotational vibrational state that you're exciting, that you're tuning to, this is the initial population uh, in that state, which only will be a fraction of the total amount of population that we're interested in, okay? Now, if you uh, substitute 137B into 136B, okay, you end up yielding this equation, and this is a time-dependent equation. And what we can see is that the upper state is going to build up linearly. Basically, for times that are much, see, if you notice this R term is just an inverse time. Since these are rates, R is just the inverse time. Okay? And so as long, for times much, much less than R to the minus 1, this thing's going to build up linearly. So we can see this term. Now, once the upper state population reaches uh, a certain fraction, you also then have loss mechanisms, right? So you can't have any loss mechanisms until we put enough in the upper state, right? So we're going to build up the upper state linearly, and then after a certain amount of time, we're going to lose just as quickly as we uh, build up. So we reach a steady state, okay? So we'll look at that solution, okay? So when uh, T is much, much greater than uh, 1 over R, we build steady state. So we need to define a couple of terms. Uh, we have the fluorescence rate, which are photons per volume per second. And then we have the number of fluorescence transitions. Okay, this is the amount of times it, 
if you want to think about, well, it goes up. These are photons per volume, okay? And that's just the integral of the fluorescence rate. So the fluorescence rate, if you look at the units, is just going to be whatever we have in the upper state population, okay? And then this is going to be the admission term, okay? So this should make sense that the rate at which we're going to get photons given off, now we're pulling, uh, we're pulling from the pool in state two, okay? And then we have uh, the spontaneous emission rate, okay? So we have a rate times a population, so we have fluorescence rate. So all we did was take our, our population in two that we got the time dependent solution before and we multiply it times A2. Now, if we integrate over the duration of the laser pulse, because you can imagine laser pulse, the photons are coming in time, right? Whether we have like nine, 10, whatever nanosecond, even microsecond pulse, whatever it is, photons are coming over the duration of that pulse and they're sending things to the upper state, okay? So if we integrate over the duration of the laser pulse, the total number of transitions uh, can be written uh, in this manner. So all we're doing is integrating from zero to the durate, over the duration laser pulse, the fluorescence rate. Now what we have, we have to think about what happens after the laser pulse is over. Because remember, we, we talked about uh, that the fluorescence has a time associated with it, okay? In the limit of an infinitesimally fast laser, we can imagine the scenario where we populate everything, send everything in the upper state, and then everything is just going to have the internal conversion, then it's just going to decay. Okay? That's not exactly if our, if our pulse duration is longer or comparable than the uh, lifetime of the upper excited state. We again, we're pumping while we're losing uh, light. Okay, so after laser pulse, once it's over, we'll, we'll deal with that right now, the population N2 has to decay. So once the laser pulse is over, we can no longer pump things to the upper state. So we're dealing with kind of the second half. N2 decays uh, from whatever condition it was at at the end of the laser pulse to zero, right? I mean, the laser pulse, once the laser pulse is done, we're done populating the upper state and everything has to decay. And the decay constant is equal to the inverse of the, pro, uh, sorry, the sum of the uh, spontaneous, spontaneous emission and then now collisional de-excitation, which in this case is just the quenching. Okay. So again, these are rates, so the inverse of that is just the time constant. And so we end up with this expression here. So we, this is only integrating from the time the pulse is done through infinity. And so we end up with, this should make sense, that uh, F, which is your transitions, is now we have our total amount that was, uh, that our final pool that we had to pull from after the laser duration times the emission rate now divided by a characteristic time at which we can completely deplete the upper state. Okay, so substitution, and now we end up with this expression for N2. Again, we have, we actually have, if you look at this, we have something that should show uh, an effect, if you think about this, for short times, we're going to see an increase, uh, and then, but this is in the limit of long time, so actually, really, we're only concerned right now with the decay, okay? So these are now for long, long time. So we can see that the population, whatever we had uh, initially in one times the, uh, times the absorption rate, this is our characteristic rate of loss, this is our emission coefficient. So all of this sort of sets what we have at the end of TL, and then we lose at some time with respect to this rate that's governed by the emission rate and the quenching rate. All right, so all we have to do is combine short times and long times. Really, that's what we're doing, and that yields the total number of fluorescence transitions. So this is just combining, so we have, we have a portion of it that's all of the transitions that are occurring while the laser pulse is going on, and we have the transitions that occur when the laser pulse is over. Okay? A definition that's commonly is just what's referred to as the saturation spectral irradiance. Okay? Again, we have our rates, we have uh, collisional de-excitation, we have uh, spontaneous emission, then we have our Einstein absorption coefficients or 
or call them Einstein B coefficients, going from 1 to 2 and 2 to 1. Once we make that definition, we're left with what can be referred to as the general analytic solution for the total number of fluorescence transitions. Okay? So we now have, so what we'll do is look at various forms of this equation in certain limit cases. We can look at cases where the laser energy is low. That would be where the irradiance here is much smaller than the saturation irradiance, right? We can look at things that are long and steady state solutions. Okay, and so these terms simplify. And we'll compare those to the full analytical or the general equation and see how well some of these approximations hold up. These are the approximations that you typically will find when you uh, seek to analyze uh, LIF equations. Okay? So let's assume that the laser pulse is long compared to this characteristic time of uh, 1 over R, then in that manner we say that steady state has been achieved, right? Because again, R, R kind of gives that time at which we have to build up the upper state. Then at that point we're, we're losing as quickly as we're gaining, and we have steady state. And in this case, the total number of fluorescence transitions is just given by this expression. And again, we, have, we still have to represent the effect of whatever laser energy slash a radiance that we're using, and then it's governed by the amount that's initially uh, in the state, the absorption rate, and then the emission rate, and the, the complete uh, depopulation rate from state two. So let's see how good of an example, or good of an approximation, the steady state solution. So if you look at what the solution has done, it's removed all the time dependence from the equation, right? Everything, this is just, you just actually put, you know your laser pulse length, you know whatever laser energy conditions, which can give you the radiance. Uh, this is a known property uh, of the transition, and so are all of these. So the steady state is a very simple expression where you don't have any time-dependent terms. So let's look at an example. Let's say that you have, we're looking at NO, and we excite at 226 nanometers, atmosphere, and 1500K, okay? Uh, we, again, if you take all the rate coefficients and quitching rates from the, from the literature, and then uh, a simple laser radiance here, 10 to the 6 watts per square meter per wave number, uh, which is a pretty common experimental value. I think this corresponds to a millijoule or so in, in, a, in a reasonable size beam, you know, a few hundred microns and something around a fraction of a wave number, something comparable you get from a dye laser and, and frequency doubling that output. Quenching rates for atmosphere usually around 10 to the 9 inverse seconds. Okay? And if you take those and you look at the full general solution, which is the solid line, and you look at the steady state solution, where these two end up uh, overlapping is the time to reach steady state. And so we can see for common values used in an experiment, the steady state approximation is, is, is reasonable. It looks like it takes about 10 to the 8 to the, to the 9, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9 seconds. Uh, your laser pulse, you know, may be 5 to 10 nanoseconds, and therefore you're operating under steady state uh, conditions. But this kind of gives you the idea how long it takes to initially populate the upper state and get to, get to a steady state condition. So if you're using, say, much shorter pulses for some reason, the steady state approximation is not, is not reasonable. Let's look at linear solution. So again, in many experiments, the laser radiance is much less than the saturation radiance, okay? So again, uh, you typically use a laser such that the signal is linear proportional to your laser energy, if you will, or your radiance, okay? So especially as we take a beam and we spin it out into a laser sheet and imaging situations, it's very hard to find the saturation condition. It's quite easy on a point measurement, but let's say uh, we're avoiding that, okay? So in the limit that I knew over I knew saturation goes to zero, what's called the lower radiant solution, which will also be called the linear solution of the integrated fluorescence rate looks a lot like this. And you can see here we're now only uh, linearly proportional to the absorption rate in whatever initial population 
And then we have this factor right here, which is essentially an efficiency factor. So this term is often called the linear fluorescence equation. So F scales linearly, uh, which is W12. But you'll remember we have uh, the absorption rate goes linearly as the irradiance times the Einstein absorption coefficient. This term is the Stern-Volmer function, uh, and you'll read it also told, called the quantum yield. So what it is, it's the ratio of transitions that actually produce a fluorescence photon. Okay? So again, we excite, they go up, we have a mechanism, they can be quenched out, right? And that's the only mechanism we have to lose. If Q was zero, this term would be one, right? Okay. When Q is much, much, much greater than A, you can actually get rid of this term, and then you just have A over Q. And that's usually, again, you'll see the way that this is written if you're looking at a lot of papers and the way you write out the fluorescence equation, especially when we get to the final version that looks probably more like you've seen, which is the fluorescence signal equation. You'll just usually have an A over Q sitting there. Okay? But this is the quantum yield. This is the number of fluorescence photons you get to the number of times you sent things from the ground state up to the excited state. Okay? This is not, usually not a very large number. This is usually something around 0.1%. Okay? It can be 0.01% for some. There are a few systems where it can be very large. Something that would have like a 1% quantum yield would be a tremendous amount of signal. I mean, an absolute uh, enormous amount of signal. Okay. Let's look at our linear solution again. So we'll compare the general analytic solution to the linear solution because what you want to know is how, you're going to, how we're going to ultimately interpret our data because we're going to uh, massage this all into a signal equation that you can manipulate. But if we have to do that from the general analytic solution, that, that can be uh, quite cumbersome. So let's again look at NO, the same case. Let's say we have this time we have a 6 nanosecond pulse length. Okay. And now what we can do is look at the fluorescence signal. I call this signal, but we'll, it's actually proportional to F. Okay? So just keep in mind we, we, we're linearly proportional to F right now. And so if we look at this, we, have, we know NO, we know the no value of the saturation. This is just a measured value. Again, we assume that the quenching rate is about 10 to the, uh, uh, 10 to the 9. Minus nine, and then our uh, uh, and t uh, L, that our pulse length is nanoseconds. Okay, okay, and so what we can do is look at this. We can see with increase. We can see that when we're very far away from the irradiant solution, which is let's say order ten to the minus six. Obviously, we see this linear change with our fluorescence f or a number of fluorescence transitions or or our fluorescent signal as a function of irradiance, which when we remove all the geometry stuff is just laser energy, right? And so really what this tells us is that until we approach the saturation irradiance, we have a linear response between the number of fluorescence transitions or the fluorescent signal and our laser irradiance, okay? And so again, it shows that this solution is, is, is quite nice if you stay far away from the saturation irradiance. Okay? So we have the relationship between F and laser radiance is nonlinear. This is what's referred to, some of you made the partially saturated regime. And again, when it asks plateaus, this is the fully saturated regime. This is where you would operate if you want to do something called saturation fluorescence. There, I'll, we're, I don't talk about this anymore, but I can quickly, in case you're interested, operating, say, out here, when you're saturated, has a, one very good property is it's independent of quenching rate, okay, because the irradiance term dominates, okay, and you can end up showing that you don't have to worry about quenching, which sounds really good. The problem with any saturation approach is you have to be careful because the wings of your laser do not saturate the transition, right? You have an intensity distribution, right? And therefore, all the energy in the wings of your intensity distribution actually end up falling through the partially saturated, which is the absolute worst one to analyze, okay? That, that has no nice approximations, and then some are down here in the linear, and they're subject to quenching. So you have sort of some quenching here, and you don't even 
quite know how to handle. You have to use a full expression, and then here quenching applies, but you're making the assumption that saturate, you're achieving saturation conditions, right? And so you have to be very careful when you operate, say, in the saturation regime, if you want to operate there to make sure that uh, the wings of the laser uh, aren't uh, giving you problems. And again, this saturation or radiance changes for each molecule, okay? And therefore, uh, you have to, it's, what's usually best is to actually just verify that you're in the linear regime. So here's an example for uh, where we measured uh, the fluorescent signal from OH in a laminar premixed flame. Again, the number of transitions is proportional to the lift signal, we'll show that. Well, let's just assume what we did is, and then your irradiance is proportional, your pulse energy is proportional to your laser irradiance, okay? And so all we did was vary the laser energy and look at the signal, and you can see uh, probably for down here through about this point you have a linear relationship and then you can start to see the partial saturation set in. So what we do instead of operating here, you want to make sure that you're in the linear regime, so we, we operated down there. So that's kind of the easy way to do it. You just measure for whatever experiment you're going to do, you measure your fluorescent signal as a function of the laser energy. Okay? And so, again, just keep in mind, uh, this was uh, just a 282 uh, beam. I, again, you can see that if you're, uh, you're down in the UV and you have very narrow uh, wavelength, let's say from a dye laser or even something that's spectrally narrow, you can actually send the large spectral radiance up very quickly. So again, it's best for whatever laser system you're going to use is to measure and see whether or not the signal response is linear with your laser energy. Okay, so now let's look just at the amount of signal you're going to capture. Uh, the fluorescence is emitted isotropically, but only a portion can be collected. You're looking usually on one side. You have a lens with a certain collection optics, so you can only collect a certain amount of this. Okay, so obviously it's going to be a function of the total number of fluorescence transitions, which is also a fluorescence rate, our collection efficiency of your system, okay, and the energy of the photons being excited. Really, you have a, and again, how many, what's the size of your volume, okay? So depending on what you want your fluorescence to be, what you call signal, okay, there's many in the literature, Someone will say you have different definitions. You have a fluorescent signal that refers to the photons collected. You can have the photons per second collected, okay? And you can have the photon power collected, okay? All these are equivalent expressions. It's just what are you calling signal, okay? Uh, and they're all equivalent definitions and they're all valid. And so they end up having this is the fluorescence uh, rate. This is the number of fluorescence transitions. Uh, we have the length of the beam, we have the cross-section area of the beam because we have to create a volume here, and we have the collection efficiency of the optics in this eta, and then HF is actually the photon energy if we want to write in terms of photon power. Okay? So this is the actual fluorescent signal that you will collect. If you look at your efficiency here, is this, this all here can embed a lot of your optical parameters along with this collection volume, okay, or this collection angle. So right here we have sort of, you can already see we have just a constant, if you will, that will characterize your system. Uh, then we have our volume. And then what we're going to have to do is we'll work within the total number of photons collected, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the number of fluorescence transitions. Uh, we need to determine those, right? Because right now we've done this very general we haven't, we haven't said anything about how way the population is distributed throughout all the different rotational levels. We don't know exactly which ones you're hitting when you tune your laser, right? We've just done this in general. There's something in state one, it goes to state two, right? We need to kind of now give you the ability to say, I know exactly how much was in when I tuned my laser to, to the Q7.5 uh, <laughs> transition, how many are in there, okay? And how does this change as a function of temperature? So that's what we'll work on next.
So let's uh, take one step further and assume that we're in the linear regime. And we'll work within photons collected. Again, something that's experimental, collection volume. Now we have our absorption rate times our initial state population. Okay, so we're starting to move toward that goal I just described. And then we have the collection efficiency or the stern volmer, volmer uh, factor. And then we have the duration of our, our laser. Okay? So we can't go any further right now until we know a little bit uh, more about how the fluorescent signal uh, Sorry, we need to know about absorption line shape. So we, we're going to need to know how the laser overlaps the transition. Okay? And we're going to need to know how the laser, uh, we need to understand how much is in each absorption transition. So we need to understand how the laser interacts with the line shape. We need to know about the line shape. We also need to know about the amount of, of population. Okay? So these are all the things to finish this. We need to move on and learn a little bit more about the absorption line shapes and how exactly we interact uh, with those lights or how the laser interacts with those line shapes. Okay? And so that's it uh, for that lecture on kind of the first part of uh, on the spectroscopy. I'll take some questions and then we'll move on to the start of the, the next lecture. We'll still take our break at normal at three o'clock. So there are any questions on, on finishing this up, on deriving the general fluorescent, fluorescence rate or transition? Yeah, so that's what you, you'll do. You normally won't find, be able to do this with a laser sheet, okay. but you, I mean, it's the way that it would be done with a laser pulse. Because okay. uh, if you look at the number work out sort of order 10 to the 6, and some of them are 10 to the 8th watts per square meter per, per wave number. Uh, if you have something that's extremely narrow in spectrally, this may be possible. But yeah, so whatever you do, whether it's a sheet or a beam, you basically just get rid of all the information in the wings and try to keep just the central intense portion. Yes. Also, yeah. oh, now you're wanting to actually put this into a system. Yes, these are much, much shorter than flow. If you look at these, these are order nanosecond time scales. And again, for turbulence time scales and in a laboratory flows, those are usually tens of microseconds, and even if you make it into uh, very high speed, those are, I mean, so those may be hundreds of microseconds, tens to 100, and then you get into very high speed flows, you would be hundreds of nanoseconds, right? So if you think about kind of characteristic speeds. So yes, you typically don't have that problem. Well, the chemical time scales vary, right? In combustion, the chemical time scales vary anywhere from nanoseconds to milliseconds, right? So if you're uh, working on something where the actual kinetics are faster than this time scale, then you would have a problem. But again, we're working on nanosecond time scales. Most of the chemistry is going to be sort of microsecond type time scale, right? And so again, all of this stuff, that's why uh, the Q-switch lasers and nanosecond pulses, they essentially, quote unquote, freeze the flow. There are orders of magnitude less than the flow time. So we don't really have to worry about these, these processes. Now, if you have a long laser, let's say you try to do this with a microsecond laser, uh, you could have some issues. Okay. Other questions? Okay, well, let's move on to the next lecture. So now we're going to look at the different factors that affect uh, the fluorescent signal. So you could, in principle, have either what we could call semi-quantitative or quantitative measurements, or at least where you know where the different signal contributions are coming from. So what we'll do is we'll talk about absorption line broadening, how they have their, how we get a, a general shape. We'll look at population distributions so you know exactly what you're exciting, and then we'll look at collisional quenching dynamics. And then we'll talk a little bit about 
uh, what you want to achieve so you can, quote unquote, choose the correct transition. And then finally, there's examples at the end so we can see where some of the applications have been. Okay, so you can probably figure out so far what we've, everything we've done in le the past two lectures would lead to what are called stick spectra. You can locate them in space now and you can, uh, you have a little something about the total amount of uh, signal you know, uh, if you knew exactly what transition you were at. But what we want to do is uh, now start to talk about the actual shape of the absorption and the emission uh, line shapes, how light, uh, actually how spectra, how the shape of the, the actual spectra, what they look like. Okay. So, uh, we're going to start talking about uh, absorption first, but the analog is the exact same thing for emission. Okay. So emission has an analog. When light's absorbed, it's going to occur over a finite bandwidth. Uh, again, we don't have infinitely thin transitions between the energy levels. Uh, and so we end up getting a, if you want to call it, a width in the frequency domain, which is referred to as a uh, line width. Again, we've talked about there's no monochromatic a light sources and we're not going to end up with monochromatic uh, transitions either. These are what are called line broadening mechanisms. We call each one of these rotational lines, if you will. They're line broadening mechanisms. We're going to discuss a couple of them. Natural lifetime broadening, collisional broadening is exactly what it sounds like. This is when you're running into molecules and that process causes broadening of the line shapes. Doppler broadening, which is sometimes referred to as just thermal broadening. And then we have what are called homogeneous and inhomogeneous processes. Homogeneous, okay, which are the first two, all molecules are subject, subjected to the laser are going to broaden in the same way. Okay? So no matter all your molecules, when they're just interacting with the laser, they're all treated the same way. Inhomogeneous implies that the molecule can, each molecule can have a different response. And what we'll see from Doppler broadening is since it's a function of temperature, you know, you can have temperature gradients and things can change. So we need to treat these in a slightly different way. So natural broadening, okay? This is one I'll go ahead and jump. It's usually neglected and I'll show that why. Natural or lifetime broadening occurs to, due to the Heisenberg principle. Uh, so we, we've defined frequent, the, the relationship between frequency and energy before, but energy is not precisely defined. Right? So it's really, there's a probability of uh, a state having a certain amount of energy. And so you can think of it as there's an average bandwidth due to the probability of positioning. Right? There's, all, there's a uncertainty due to, to its probabilistic nature. There's an uncertainty of where this energy is. And again, if averaged over time, which is still a very small time, you end up with some statistical distribution. Okay, of where that actual energy level is, okay? just because we can't precisely define uh, energy. So the width, the actual if, width, uh, is there's a finite excited state lifetime. So we can think about this if the process has a very short lifetime, then it's going to have a very large uncertainty, so a large bandwidth. Think about this as the time frequency type uh, bandwidth, uh, bandwidth product. Uh, the time frequency product. So if the process has a short lifetime, it's going to have a very large uncertainty or, or a very large bandwidth. And if it has a long lifetime, it'll have a very narrow uh, bandwidth. Now, large uh, and narrow and broad in the uh, extent of natural broadening are, are certainly relative terms, okay? So let's look at what kind of this line width contribution is. Okay, the line width is essentially AIJ, right, which is our uh, emission rate divided by 2 pi C. And if we uh, look at this, the line shape function is described by a Lorentzian, where we have uh, our frequency, uh, this is our center frequency, this would be any frequency that it's broadened, this is any, any new, this is our, our value, uh, that's due to our emission rate, okay? 
and we can get our Laurentian distribution that describes the line shape due to natural broadening, right? This process, this is very small. It's something about 10 to the minus 5 wave numbers, okay? So this essentially compared to all the other processes that we'll talk about is a stick, okay? So this is ignored. This contributes very little to the process. But we can talk, now we want to talk about two both collisional and Doppler broadening that actually give rise to the line shapes that we're uh, used to seeing. Okay. So again, all these are kind of uh, meaty definitions, but let's try to uh, glean out the important parts. Collisional broadening is going to result from collisions. Okay, so you're in some uh, molecules in the excited state. It runs into another molecule, as they frequently do. And then their frequent collision which means there's a frequent interruption of the interaction with the radiated field, uh, results in a broadened transition. So really what happens is that when we're sending the laser through, which is a lot of photons, right? So there's a tremendous amount of photons. Each one of those is interacting with the molecule, trying to go up to the upper state, and then the molecule comes and runs into another molecule, and this continues to happen over and over again, right? And so what happens is the collisions change the phase of the coherence of the light, and therefore it changes the response of the molecule to the frequency of light, okay? And so this constant interruption of the process essentially ends up uh, changing how the molecule responds to the light, and so it gives it small perturbations to its actual position in energy space. So basically you're just getting constantly interrupted the coherence and you're changing the response, and therefore you're ending up with this distribution, if you will, of where the energy is, okay? So this is also a Lorentzian function, okay? Defined again uh, such that the integral of all frequencies is unity. Now, we need to get this collision broadened width, which is this delta nu c, okay? Uh, it has to be a function of local composition. That makes sense because it should be important what the collider is, whether it's big, small, Okay, uh, and it's going to end up being a function of pressure, as you can imagine, because the higher the pressure is, the larger number of these colliders you put into a, to a box. Okay, so it's usually cast as an empirical relationship, and that empirical relationship, again, is a function of pressure, so it's a function of composition, pressure, and then it's going to be also a fu uh, function of temperature, okay, because temperature is also going to control Again, how much in per unit volume, how many of these colliders you have. So again, this collision width is determined uh, via typical measurements and empirical relationships. So again, you can think about one would measure out the collision line width. They will work in a, in a system where, let's say, there's a well-known temperature, and we'll get to the Doppler broadening where you can deconvolve the Doppler broadening component. Then you're left with the collision uh, component because Again, I'm jumping three, three slides ahead where we show how we get these. They're actually just superpositions of the collision, the Doppler, which is the Voigt profile. We'll get to this. But, and then you measure out what these actual empirical relationships had to be. And then someone tabulates them, and then you can go and use them. Okay? So again, all these are reference temperature and constants uh, that are determined. Okay, compared to natural broadening, if you remember the natural broadening, uh, this should be C, sorry, correct in your notes, I'll correct this night. This, uh, the natural broadening is 10 to the minus 5, but delta C, the collisional uh, line, is about 0.3 wave numbers, so significantly higher. Again, this kind of already tells you that the natural broadening line width is negligible, right? But our collisional broadening is appreciable, okay, 0.3 wave numbers. Can we see that? It's negligible. Now, collisions also move the transition. It's called a frequency shift. So not only are they broadening the transition, when I say broadening, again, if we look in frequency space versus new, what we had before, all we could tell you is where the position was, correct? We had a stick spectra, okay? Now, 
If we consider just the collision width, we now, this is what we have, we have broadening, right? And we now have this. Okay. Now, what happens is when they collide, okay, they also lead to a shift. And this shift is the same thing as the broadening mechanism. It's a function of species and temperature. And so what happens is that means actually what you end up getting is that due to collisions, you actually move the spectral position from collision. And so you have to take that into account. So again, so we know now already before we've looked at Doppler broadening just in collisions, we have collisions that are going to broaden the transition and they can shift them over. And these are function of species. So you can, you can imagine that this line position due to collisions can move around in frequency space. Okay, now Doppler broadening, the one that's most well known, again, this is just due to the Doppler effect. You'll remember molecules have kinetic energy. You learn this uh, in physics. Again, usually they're characterized by a Boltzmann distribution, but we know that we have all these molecules that are moving around very fast, right? Well, if they move, then each one of those has to have, if they're moving with reference to a fixed observer, there has to be a Doppler effect, okay? And then what happens, but since you have many, 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 many molecules, that are moving many, many times over the duration of laser pulse, you get a net effect, which is the Doppler broadening of the transition, okay? So again, you can just see this uh, radiative emission on average uh, for a molecule traveling toward, an, well, any instantaneous as well, the molecule traveling toward the observer will appear at a higher frequency, traveling way will be at a lower frequency, but since there's many, many of these molecules, it happens many, many times you, without even and going on, we would know that this will take on a Gaussian distribution, right? We have to have, uh, it's just a probabilistic description. Okay. So at low densities, the velocities are given by Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, okay? And then what we know is that the temperature governs the velocity distribution, and hence the frequency distribution. So working within this, we end up getting that the Doppler line shape is given by a Gaussian distribution. Okay. We have our width here. This is the full width half max of the Gaussian distribution. Again, any position, this is our center frequency. Again, i.e. where we initially, we can say where the center of the, uh, the transition is. Okay. And we can see that our, Doppler, our full width half max of the Doppler distribution is proportional to square root of temperature and the molecular weight. So we can see here that it's going to get broad with temperature, but as the species, the particular species, gets larger and larger, it gets narrower, okay? So this is a Gaussian distribution. Now, if we're in the situation where both Doppler and collisional broaden are of the same order, both effects must be considered. So the two line shapes then are convolved to get the actual absorption emission line shapes. Uh, the convolution of Lorentzian and uh, Gaussian gives you a Voigt profile, which we're going to call Y, and that's the actual nomenclature we use for the absorption line width, okay? And again, what we have here, you can look, these are just, these are well-known mathematical uh, distributions. We have the Voigt function, and but what we have are a key parameter that's embedded in this V, this Voigt parameter, right, this Voigt function, is the ratio of the collisional uh, line width and the Doppler line width, okay? What's going to be important is this value A we can see here, is that in the limit that this is zero, the entire thing uh, reduces to a Gaussian function, okay? And the limit that uh, uh, delta nu C is much, much, much bigger than the Doppler, this thing uh, in the limit is a Lorentzian function. So let's look at these. Uh, this is just any generic species for 1,000K for different values of A1 and 2, okay? Uh, sorry, this is, but they're done for a specific, sorry, it's a little small. This is the Doppler line width of 0.18 wave numbers. That's, I think this is what's NO. A lot of these examples were from NO. This is NO at, I think, 1,000 
Kelvin. Okay, so you get 0.18 wave numbers. What happens if we're dealing with a case where A is very small? Again, like I said, the Doppler bonding dominates. If we look at the Voigt profile, it looks a lot like the Gaussian. But now as A increases, whether we're decreasing temperature, whether we're getting very cold, or we're increasing pressure, more and more collisions, okay, we end up, the collisional effects dominate, and then at A of 2, we look, and because we can see these very long wings, the actual uh, profile looks a lot like a Laurentian, okay? For a lot of cases that you'll deal with, Say whether, again, if you're at atmosphere, the whole range 300 to 2,000, sorry, sorry, low temperatures, you'll get something that's really Laurentian. At high temperatures, you'll get Gaussian, but for the temperatures in between, you'll have something that where the full Voigt profile is needed. Okay. And the reason why this is kind of a pain is a Voigt is computationally expensive to, to calculate. Now we have to look at how the laser actually interacts with this absorption line shape. Hopefully we know that we have this line shape. This is just kind of collision, but then if we convolve on the uh, Doppler, we end up with a Voigt profile. So we already know, let's just say this is the Voigt profile or any singular one of these. So we now already know that there's a distribution of the absorption uh, in space. So obviously if I put my laser here, I get no absorption. But I don't have to go right to the center. Once I put right here, I start to uh, absorb. But the other thing we have to think about is our laser also has some distribution, whatever it may be, right? So as we tune our laser, we have an interaction between the laser bandwidth, okay, and the actual spectral uh, feature, okay? So hopefully this makes sense. We have some finite bandwidth to our laser. We have some finite bandwidth to our absorption transition. And as they overlap, they'll have an interaction. We need to describe that mathematically. So we, we, have to, we, we have to do some things to make our life a little easier. So let's define our spectral irradiance. Uh, let's define the spectral irradiance just in this quantity. We'll call it I nu of nu, so that's a function of what, because we have a distribution of our laser radiance now, it's not just one value now, right? So it has to be a function of nu, okay? Uh, we're going to define it in this manner. We're gonna, essentially the way we're doing it is we satisfy this. Let, let's talk about this I nu superscript, I, if we will, is the normalized spectral radiance, which we'll show in just a second. And L prime is the dimensionless spectral distribution function just so that you have whatever characteristic uh, shape your laser has. Let's say it's a Gaussian. It needs to be integrated such the integral goal of that is to say the full width half max, okay? All this is is a normalization. So your L prime just tells you this, you, we're not changing anything of the shape. You can see here, this is the full width max of the laser spectral distribution function. And again, L prime is what the actual shape of the laser is, but we have to satisfy this such that it integrates to the full width half max of the laser. It's a little confusing, but it's just based on we're um, making sure uh, the units work out well, okay? So then this normalized spectral irradiance, you can do some math and all it is is the integral of your actual radiance over frequency space, which then means that your total irradiance that you have in your laser can be written as the normalized times delta nu. So, or otherwise, your normalized irradiance is just the irradiance of your laser, which we typically know, divided by the full width half max. Okay? So, once we have this quantity, we can now define the dimensionless overlap integral. So, the overlap integral we'll define here. Now we're just going to integrate overall frequency space. Whatever our laser line shape looks like, this is the distribution of the laser intensity. Again, just normalize such that its integral equals the full width half max, okay? And then times our absorption profile here. So one distribution, another distribution, okay? So this describes how the distribution of the laser 
intensity overlaps the distribution of the absorption uh, transition. Okay, hopefully that's clear. This, is kind of, this tells you a single parameter. So you can imagine if my laser distribution is way over here, my absorption, that quantity is going to be zero, right? So as these two distributions start to come closer and closer together, you're going to take on finite values of the dimensionless overlap, okay? The reason we do this, it gives you a very straightforward way to look at uh, the absorption, okay, that's due to your laser, so the stimulated absorption. Otherwise, you're trying to make more difficult corrections to treating them as stick, it's right, two monochromatic limits, and then you're trying to make some sort of correction uh, to the fact that they have real width. In this manner, your stimulated absorption is just defined by your Einstein B coefficient, this normalized intensity, okay, and our dimensionless overlap. This is already taking care of all the proper normalizations to worry about their, their integration in frequency space. So take a look at those equations and you know, tomorrow, if you have any questions, ask me. But I think this, this, this uh, should be straightforward by looking at enough. Okay? The reason why we want to do this is now then this normalized spectral irradiance is just calculated from physical quantities. That's the energy of the laser, right? That's the full width half max of the laser. What, that's what we call the line width of the laser. A is the laser beam cross-sectional area, and T and L is the laser pulse. So. Uh, we've already, because we've normalized out uh, on the previous, if you look on the previous page, we've gotten rid of all the other characteristics, the full width and all its integration over spectral space. We've, we've removed all the, uh, we've essentially accounted for all of the integration over spectral space, such that we can get the normalized uh, irradiance just as a function of properties we can, we either know or can easily measure. Okay. Now, so what is this dimensionless overlap integral? Uh, again, I think you can probably start to visualize, I said it's the interaction between the distribution of the laser intensity and the absorption profile, but it, can, it should be interpreted as the ratio of the total photon absorption rate in the actual system, okay? Remember, it's been broadened through these mechanisms and shifted perhaps to collisions. So it's the total, uh, it's the ratio of the total photon absorption rate in your actual system to which would exist if both of them were uh, monochromatic, okay? So if this quantity is one, you're getting the exact same photon absorption rate in your real system as you would in the monochromatic limit, where both your laser and your absor absorption line width were perfect delta functions, okay? So in some ways you're maximizing the photon absorption rate. Uh, let's see, let's look at some limits. Again, you can see that one's the monochromatic limit, Okay, again, monochromatic laser interacting with monochromatic absorption feature. Zero means there's absolutely no interaction whatsoever. So let's look at a couple of limit cases. If the line width of the laser is much less than the absorption line width, okay, then, then the dimensionless uh, overlap uh, function will simply go to the, the full width half max of the laser divided by the absorption line width. Now let's say we have a broadband laser such that the line width of a laser is much, much wider than that of the absorption. Then the overlap goes to one. And hopefully this makes sense. If I have an extremely broad laser, let's say this is my transition, I have an extremely broad laser, I will excite all of the photons in that absorption just by kind of a hook or crook method, right? I just, so my laser overlaps all of them. So our dimensionless overlap fraction is one. So this is actually quite important. The interaction between the laser and the absorption uh, is pretty critical for quantitative measurements. Again, this is an example of NO, where if we look at, there's a lot of closely spaced rotational lines such that you don't even cleanly resolve uh, the, with this type of resolution, right? So the red are simulated rotational lines, but they're accurate, so, and they're broad. And then we look at two lasers. We have a very narrow laser. It's like 0.1 wave numbers, and we have a very broad. If we have a very narrow, the, we're basically overlapping just with one feature, but we do not have clear overlap. 
uh, so we'll have a fraction much less than one. And we have a very broad laser, we would have overlap, complete overlap with whatever this isolated transition, if we could isolate, but we're also overlapping all these other uh, lasers of which we don't have a full overlap. So we have to consider all of those interactions as well. And we'll get to that of how you consider all of your possible interactions. But that's why one has to calculate this dimensionless overlap to see the actual uh, amount of uh, photons transitions that you, um, that you actually are accessing. Okay, so the Boltzmann fraction, okay? Okay, so now we can start talking about now how the different uh, molecules are, or, or how the, they're di just over the ground state, if you will, how they're distributed. So again, we've, we've talked about this. If you tune your laser to any particular rotation, you're only, at best, exciting a small fraction because at any point in time, uh, only a certain amount are going to lie, uh, of your population is going to lie in a given rotational and vibrational state. And this is all temperature dependent. We can think about this from the energy point of view is that any temperature, the molecule does not occupy all energy levels, okay? Uh, you may remember this from physics is that the internal energy is distributed and often referred to as partitioned amongst the various energy modes. It's distributed over the electronic vibration and rotational states. Okay? So if you've had statistical thermo, this is old hat. This is how you end up, this is how we end up with a spectra is the fact that our energy is distributed over many different uh, rotational vibrational levels. Okay. Now, coming back to what we just finished up in what's lecture nine, uh, the fluorescence rate or the number of fluorescence transitions, uh, the fluorescence rate is proportional to the number de density of the directly pumped lower level. Okay, so this is where I was getting back to that. That was what that sort of generic N1 was. It's whatever you're directly pumped, but that is only a fraction of the total amount of population in the ground state. So now we need to know how the molecule is distributed over all the possible energy states, okay? So the reason why this is important is pragmatically, you quote unquote tune your laser to one transition. Let's say in an imaging experiment, you tune your laser to a particular position and you make a measurement. And then you measure fluorescent signal. You need to be able to relate in one of the directly pumped state to the actual population in the actual ground state, the total population. And this comes through uh, the Boltzmann fraction. Okay. Again, referring back to 154, uh, we'll know that for sufficient low density, we just did this a couple slides ago. Uh, again, assuming that we have enough collisions so we have equilibrium, we always know that we have a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Okay? We know that the velocity is always called Maxwellian if we have enough collisions uh, to equilibrate. Okay? Now, along with kinetic energy, again, kinetic energy is translational. The internal modes are also quantized, okay? and so the electronic, vibrational, and rotational uh, can be treated uh, separately, and we'll get to that. Okay, so let's just a couple more things and then we'll take our break. So uh, let's start to think about this. At low temperatures, all of the molecules lie within the ground vibrational state. Okay, so let's say we're at some temperature. So everything's lying. Now it's distributed over different vibrational states and it's distributed certainly over different rotational states, but they're all in the ground electronic state. Now, again, similar to kinetic energy, so that's the translational, let's think about our internal. The distribution, as temperature increases, so we're gonna increase temperature, the distribution increases. So we can think about this, we're gonna to start to occupy more and more rotational states, we're gonna occupy more and more vibrational states, okay? And so we start distributing, instead of just at a few rotational states within maybe one or two vibrational levels, we're gonna start distributing over more rotational states and over more vi vibrational levels, okay? We just know as this thing gets hot, we're gonna vibrate more and we're gonna rotate uh, faster. So we can distribute, we can populate more levels. Now also in the same way, certain rotational levels are gonna become depopulated, okay? Uh, and it, 
and again, others are populated, some are depopulated. We'll see how that's governed in a second. But also what happens is uh, the higher electronic states actually can be populated without the influence of la laser. Now remember in our model, we said this doesn't happen, right? It, this is all before the laser even arrives, right? These are just the molecule itself. And we said, okay, uh, our state two, before the laser arrives, there's absolutely nothing in the upper excited state. Well, for very high temperatures, you actually can have this, okay? You can actually have population here. You would have to take that into account as your initial condition. Uh, but for our two-level model, we ignore that. It's typically a small fraction, so uh, we'll stay away from that. Okay, so this is a great place to stop now. We'll go into the actual partition functions of the Boltzmann fraction. And probably the best thing is take a break, and then when I'm done with the entire lecture, we'll take, we'll take questions of, of this entire lecture. So let's just meet back at uh, 3.15, okay? <laughs>